Hello everybody, Professor Barth is here, history professor at Arizona State University. All right, well, the title says it all. Communism is the most wretched and murderous economic system ever devised by man. In the second half of this lecture, I will read at length some excerpts from Czeslaw Malosh's The Captive Mind. The Captive Mind, an absolute classic in, uh, in 20th century uh, uh, political thought. Highly, highly recommend this book. I'll save, uh, uh, I'll save uh, my thoughts on that for later in the lecture, but you're not going to want to miss that. All right, let's begin with a basic working definition of communism. Communism is in, or was, is an ideology or movement that supports an all-encompassing revolutionary socioeconomic system, a system characterized primarily by the collective ownership of the means of production, collective ownership of the means of production. Its proponents argue that such a system will eliminate the supposed exploitation of labor, as well as the existence of economic classes. Under communism, in theory, the distribution of consumer goods is based upon need. To quote the famous uh, Marxist slogan, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Now, the under uh, pure or uh, philosophical communism, theoretical communism, uh, there's a prediction that in the future, communism will exist in a stateless society. A future stateless society where the state will wither away. And yet, history has proven that this is a utopian mirage. In practice, all property in communist regimes is owned and, or controlled by a totalitarian, authoritarian, one-party state. And communism, in fact, requires authoritarianism, requires violence, as we will see, because communism, communism goes against man's nature. It violates innate human characteristics. And so for communism to exist, it must be imposed from on top uh, with a uh, fist or a barrel of a gun. Now, the ideal vision of a communist society, of a society with collective ownership and the elimination of economic classes, has, as we all know, inspired many millions of people since as far, as, as far back as the early to mid-19th century. It's inspired millions. However, many millions more were and remain uh, cudgeled into accepting it compelled, again, by the barrel of a gun to accept this system. The reality, as evidenced by history, is that communism is a failed and evil ideology. A failed and evil Ideology. Now, I use the word evil very deliberately and quite literally. By evil, I mean uh, an objectively uh, repugnant system. It is Communism is objectively repugnant from a moral standpoint. Not just from a moral standpoint, by the way, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, from a rational standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from many different standpoints. But from a moral standpoint, it is uh, morally, morally repugnant. And the failure of communism and its attendant evils is one of the greatest lessons from the 20th century. At least 100 million victims were murdered at the hands of communist regimes in the 20th century. It's an astonishing number. It's unfathomable, the number of murdered victims at the hands of communist regimes. To say nothing of the millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of people whose lives uh, may not have been uh, killed, however they were ruined, uh, or driven to total misery. 
of the uh, 100 million victims of communism, murdered by communism, the majority, 65 million, were killed in communist China, 30 million in the Soviet Union, and then from there you have other uh, countries, Cambodia, North Korea, etc. Uh, and yet, <laughs> despite this terrible record, despite this terrible record, uh, there exists in America and in the West a strange collective amnesia as to the, the true death toll and misery of communism in the 20th century. Not in the former Eastern Bloc or former Soviet Union per se, but in, in the West and in America, this uh, amnesia, uh, this ignorance of the true nature of communism. And I think this ignorance, in my, in my view, speaks uh, to the broader failure of the educational system here in the United States. Of course, communism is not simply in the past. Communism is also in the present. At present, 1.5 billion people still live under communist regimes. Most of them, of course, in China. And here you see uh, the 200th anniversary of the birth of Karl Marx, May 5th, 1818, 200 years in uh, 2018, celebrated there. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has erected a totalitarian super state enforced by a high-tech mass surveillance grid. The party refuses to tolerate even the remotest semblance of political dissent. And of course, it's been in the news lately, the CCP has thrown as many as 3 million Muslim Uyghurs into gulag concentration camps. And here's some of those camps. This is going on today. So it's leaked uh, drone footage of one of those camps, and you'll notice the prisoners are blindfolded. Here in the United States, we have a Bill of Rights. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom of religion. We have a right to bear arms. We have due process of law. We have habeas corpus. We have historically unparalleled prosperity. And there are ups and downs, of course. But historically speaking, relative to the rest of the world and relative to previous eras of history, unparalleled prosperity in the United States. We have the largest middle class in world history. And for that, Americans are spoiled. We are a spoiled people, wildly, wildly ignorant of history and of real life conditions in the world around us. And our ignorance is, uh, is at our uh, peril. There was a poll conducted in October of 2020, sponsored by the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. It's a, uh, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation is a congressionally authorized nonprofit. They worked with YouGov, which is a major polling firm based out of London, in order to poll Americans' views on communism. And there were a lot of very, very interesting things in this poll, but I want to just look at three points, uh, data points. This is just from a few months ago, less than a year ago. Only 63%, only 63% of Gen Z and millennials believe that the Declaration of Independence better guarantees freedom and equality over the Communist Manifesto. Only 63% believe that the Declaration of Independence guarantees freedom and equality more than the Communist Manifesto. Yeah, now, you might look at this and say, well, only 9% said the Communist Manifesto. Okay. But 28% said, don't know. Don't know. <laughs> How do you not know? <laughs> uh, that's an astonishing poll there. By the way, look at this, the silent generation, which is sort of the generation that grew up in the 30s and 40s. 95% said Declaration of Independence. Only 4% said don't know. Only 1% said the Communist Manifesto. Take a look at this one. 20% of Gen Z and 17% of millennials think that society would be better off if all prop private property was abolished and held by the government. 
private property abolished. <laughs> it says all private property, all private property owned by the public and managed by the government, managed by the state. Look at that, 20% of Gen Z, 17% of millennials. Silent generation, only 2%. That is unbelievable. And again, what is going on here with this 29%? I don't know. What do you mean you won't know? It's pretty, pretty astounding. A little frightening, I'm not going to lie, looking at a stat like that. Again, the failure of the American educational system. And then look at this. Favorable opinion of the term communism, 28% of Gen Z and 22% of millennials have a favorable opinion of the term communism. Well, enter Czeslaw Malouche, the primary hero in this lecture. Malouche was born in 1911 to a Polish family in Lithuania. Lithuania at that time was part of the Russian Empire. He uh, passed away in 2004 at the ripe old age of 93 years old. He was a poet. He's considered one of the greatest poets of the 20th century. Now this book is not is nonfiction, uh, but he was a, a poet, intellectual. During uh, In the 1940s, during World War II, he joined the underground resistance against uh, Nazi, Nazi occupation of Poland in Warsaw uh, and actually uh, illegally published various works underground. Then after World War II, Poland became a Soviet satellite country. Now, Milosz never joined the Communist Party, but he remained around for about six more years after World War II ended and actually served as a uh, uh, sort of cultural diplomat for uh, the People's Republic of Poland, as it was now called, in uh, New York City and in, in Washington, D.C., later in Paris. And he served in that capacity from 1945 to 1951. However, under pressure from Stalin, the Polish government after World War II became more and more oppressive, and uh, Milosz feared, rightly so, that the communist authorities were going to come after him. So he defected to the West, went to, uh, left to Paris, became a critic of Stalinism, published The Captive Mind in 1953. His uh, poetry was banned all across the Soviet Union. He, uh, it was actually not even legal to speak his name, uh, even if one was to denounce it. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, again, we'll, we'll look at this book soon in greater detail. He joined the faculty as a vi at UC Berkeley in 1960 as a uh, visiting lecturer. He was there throughout the 60s and 70s. Actually, in the late 60s, he was a critic of the uh, some of the student protesters. He called them, quote, spoiled children of the bourgeoisie, end quote. Retired from uh, Berkeley in 1978. And then 1980, this is him in, uh, I believe, 1981. In 1980, Miloš won the Nobel Prize in Literature. After the fall of, the, of communism in Poland in 1989, Milos was able to return back uh, to his home country and moved to Krakow in 2000 and lived out the remaining four years of his life. Captive Mind was written uh, pretty much immediately after Milos de defected from Stalinist Poland in 1951. Now in this book, Milos analyzes the various methods and the uh, moral consequences, the cultural consequences of Soviet communism in Poland, which he witnessed firsthand. Uh, Milosz was a member of the ruling class in Poland, I mean, in post-war satellite state Poland. And so he had an insider view. Uh, he drew upon this expertise, expertise that he had gained. And the book uses a number of case studies to analyze the thought processes, uh, processes of of, uh, of intellectuals living in Stalinist Poland, uh, the allure of Stalinism. And then he also looks at compliant artists, compliant writers, uh, uh, compliant intellectuals, okay? intellectuals who just went along uh, with, with, the, with the system. Look at the 
the uh, the wording here, and this is the original cover of the book. It's gone through many editions, of course. An urgent message to the West on the communist mentality in the tragic moral and intellectual condition of the men and women who live under Stalinism. So that is, that is the idea uh, in this book. It's a remarkable book. Brought him much fame. And again, is, was the inspiration for this video. Great cover there. He has uh, Milos said this, Never before has there been such enslavement through consciousness as in the 20th century. And he's absolutely right about that. Uh, mental slavery is really, at, at its core, what these communist regimes are about, and also uh, on the far left and on the far right, the fascist regi regimes that had also catapulted to power in uh, the 1920s, 1930s, both of these totalitarian systems waged war on the human mind. But Stalinism did so with a, a precision that's just absolutely remarkable. And so that brings us, before we read some selected excerpts from, from Miloš, let me just cover the, the context here. Um, Miloš is writing at a time in which Stalin is the dictator of the Soviet Union. Now, Joseph Stalin first became general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1922. He did not have a monopoly of power. Uh, Lenin dies in 1924, and after Lenin's death, Stalin began consolidating power. By the 1930s, especially by the mid to late 1930s, Stalin had completely solidified his position as dictator in the Soviet Union and then ruled in that manner until his death in 1953. There's a younger Stalin. Uh, the exact numbers of, uh, of victims are very, very difficult to calculate. And the reason for that is you have sort of two categories of, of deaths under Stalinist uh, Russia or Soviet Union. You have what you could call excess deaths, which include direct, deliberate killings, but excess deaths also include, and probably the majority of excess deaths fall under this category, deaths that resulted directly from bad policy, like grievously bad, bad policy. Okay, but it wasn't direct in a sense of, like for example, uh, uh, the the Jews murdered in uh, in Nazi Germany. Those are direct killings. Okay. Excess deaths include more than that, and so it's it's difficult to calculate. Uh, historians estimate that at least at least six million direct, just straight out, flat out murders under Stalin's regime, and then if you include excess deaths, many millions more. And so this was a uh, extremely murderous regime. Now, one of the major causes of death during Stalin's rule was the collectivization of agriculture. Beginning in 1928 through the 1930s, Stalin enacted a program of uh, agricultural collectivization. He forcibly removed peasants from their privately held farmland and uh, placed them onto state-run farms. This led to uh, food shortages, uh, a number of famines. There's some uh, peasants working on state-run collective farms after having been thrown off the land. Some peasants fled, and uh, but your uh, privately held land, almost nearly all of it is eliminated. By 1936, 90% of households in the Soviet Union who worked in the agricultural sector worked on state-run farms. Uh, there was a, uh, here's a prop, piece of propaganda, the Soviets were master propagandists, uh, along with their distant cousins and the Nazis. 
uh, totalitarian movements. You got your master propaganda. This is a, a Soviet propaganda poster, cult, uh, poster celebrating the collectivization of agriculture. Look how happy these people are. And uh, here's some more. And you see, uh, and there, it's all for a collective goal. But this is the reality. Look how dehumanizing this is. Day in, day out. And the, again, the famines. The worst famine, the most notorious famine, came in 1932 to 1933, and it was directly caused by the collectivization of agriculture. This famine in 32 and 33 resulted in the deaths of at least, at least 5 to 7 million people, and some estimates go as high as 12 million people. Some estimates go as high as 12 million people. This is just a single famine, 1932 to 33. The, the area that was worst affected was the Ukraine, the Northern Caucasus as well, but especially Ukraine. And Ukraine, these are just starving people on the streets. Ukraine was the former breadbasket of Eastern Europe. Some gruesome images here, folks. <laughs> uh, the Soviet government, now there's a lot of debate about how much, how deliberate was this? I think the evidence is pretty darn high that this was a deliberate uh, decision from the Soviet government to at least allow the people to starve, okay? Bare minimum, the, uh, the Soviet government, government deliberately allowed, especially the Ukrainian people, to starve. Millions of people. In fact, today, th this event, this famine of 32 and 33 in, in the Ukraine is known as the uh, Holodomor. The Holodomor is sometimes referred to as the Forgotten Holocaust caused again directly by collectivization of agriculture. And then the other source of death was just sheer political terror. During the Great Purge of 1937 and 1938, more than 1 1.2 million people were executed following phony trials, show trials, that branded them as political enemies of the state. 1.2 million people executed in this single great purge in 1937-1938 so that by 1938 the only party members that remained were uh, Stalin loyalists. And all throughout Stalin's regime in the 30s, the 40s, into the early 50s, political prisoners were uh, sent to uh, what were called gulags. The gulags were a uh, network of forced labor camps, slave labor camps, all throughout the Soviet Union. And here you have all, look at this, unbelievable, the number of gulags all throughout the Soviet Union. The gulag system began under Vladimir Lenin, however it peaked under Joseph Stalin. Between 1930 and 1953, Approximately 18 million people, 18 million people passed through the gulag system. How many deaths? Again, difficult to calculate, but it's in it's at least a couple million, maybe more. This is uh, housing at one of these labor camps, a gulag labor camp. Here's another photograph of a gulag labor camp. There's a lot of resemblance resemblances to some of the photographs we have of um, Jewish victims in concentration camps in the, in the 40s in Germany. Uh, in forced labor. And, you know, people are there for a variety of reasons, whether they may have been, there may have been some legitimate political dissidents. Uh, doesn't justify it, obviously, but many more were just people who were falsely accused or just even did the slightest little thing that caused them to be suspect or uh, perhaps they owned too much property or they were seen uh, maybe hoarding grain during times of, uh, of, uh, of food shortages. This is a gulag uh, housing unit. Um, imagine you're in this gulag and you have to wake up to these posters every day. Stalin and there's Karl Marx. Just reminded every day, we control you. 
absolute just uh, mind blowing. But oh, Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe, as he was known by uh, admirers in the West and in the United States, good old Uncle Joe, again, master propagandist, master propagandist. Because of that propaganda, by the way, to this day, he remains quite popular among many people in Russia. See him as this uh, sort of grandfatherly figure who represented a better times than uh, in Russian history. Strength, you know. So, that brings us back to Malosh, right? In the captive mind, again, uh, it, it, there's a lot to talk about here. I'm, I'm, in this section of the lecture, this final section of the lecture, I'm going to I'm going to focus in on the uh, on what he says about the economics of Soviet communism, because I think uh, Malosh, in in what I'm reading from here, is I believe the final chapter or near the end of this book. Malosh crystallizes, uh, distills down the just enormous economic errors of communism in the passages we're about to read. Um, Milos says this, uh, in, the, in the Eastern Bloc countries, in the Eastern Bloc uh, were the, those countries like Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and these Eastern Bloc countries, which were satellite states controlled by the Soviet Union, quote, a battle is being waged for mastery over the human spirit. Man must be made to understand, for then he will accept. Who are the enemies of the new system? The people who do not understand. So this is the mental slavery that Malosh is speaking of. The battle for mastery over the human spirit. And so enemies of the system are to be targeted. Now, for Soviet officials looking to identify potential enemies... Malosh says, different groups of people are the main object of study. The first group, former industrialists, wealthy capitalists, and large landowners. So these would be people in Poland or, again, Lithuania, Czechoslovakia, any of these Eastern Bloc countries that are now under the control of Stalinist uh, Russia. Second group, we'll look at all these in, in, in detail here, the uh, so-called petty bourgeoisie. These would be shopkeepers, small merchants, craftsmen, people know, who have a moderately middle-class existence, uh, but participate in commerce. They're not wealthy, uh, but they are fairly well-to-do, and they, uh, they have, are a crucial element of the commercial system, especially in the towns and, and in the cities. A third group, as an object of stu study for Soviet officials, according to Malosh, peasants and agricultural laborers, we'll look at them. And then the fourth group, factory workers, the proletariat so-called. <clears throat> so let's uh, go, back, go back to Malosh here and read directly from the text. Different groups of people, he says, are the main object of study. The least important is the property class, which was dispossessed by the nationalization of factories and mines and by the agricultural reform. Their number is insignificant. Their way of thinking amusingly old-fashioned. They are no problem. In time, they will die off, if need be, with a little help. So this is what we might call, uh, here in the United States, the 1%, right? These are wealthy people. These would be, in our uh, nation today, the millionaires, or maybe even some of the billionaires. Uh, they're not much of a concern for the Soviet Union. Um, they are, again, amusingly old-fashioned. In time, they'll die off, maybe with a little help. The second group's a little more dangerous for Soviet officials. The petty bourgeoisie, that is, the small... Merchants and craftsmen cannot be taken so lightly. They constitute a powerful force, one that is deeply rooted in the masses. Oh, okay, so the masses, uh, you look up to these people to a, a significant degree, the petty bourgeoisie, so the Soviets have to tread a little carefully here. Hardly is one clandestine workshop or store liquidated in one neighborhood or city than another springs up elsewhere. Restaurants hide behind a sliding wall of a private house. Shoemakers and tailors work at home for their friends. In fact, everything that comes under the heading of speculation, so-called, sprouts up again and again. 
they just can't get rid of them, these petty bourgeoisie. They're, they're always uh, creating new business, small businesses and setting up shop here and there. It's almost as though it's an innate part of the human condition to want to participate in some sort of commercial activity. Again, this is why communism requires violence. It requires force because it is innate in human nature. So, sprouts up again and again. And no wonder. State and municipal stores, communist stores, state stores, consistently lack even the barest essentials. In the summer, one can buy winter clothes. In the winter, summer wear, but usually of the wrong size and of poor quality. The purchase of a spool of thread or a needle is a major problem, for the one state store in the town may not carry them for a year. Clothes that are given to be mended are held by the local crafts cooperative for six months. The ends, called points of collective nourishment, I suppose that's, is that, was that the politically correct term in, uh, in the Soviet unions? Allegedly so. The ends are so crowded that people lose the desire to drink with their friends. They know they will have to sit down at a table with strangers and wait, sometimes as long as an hour before the waiter appears. All this creates a field for private services. Gee, I wonder why. A worker's wife goes to a nearby town, buys needles and thread, brings them back and sells them. The germ of capitalism. Oh my. The worker himself of a free afternoon mends a broken bathroom pipe for a friend who has waited months for the state to send him a repairman. In return, he gets a little money, enough to buy him a shirt. A rebirth of capitalism. Uh-oh. Can't allow that. <laughs> So this worker mends a broken bathroom pipe for a friend. He hasn't time to wait in line on the day that the state store receives a new shipment of goods, so he buys his shirt from a friend. She has cleverly managed to buy three, let us say, through her friendship with the sales girl, and now she resells them at a small profit. She is speculating. What she earns as a cleaning woman in a state factory is not enough to support her three children since her husband was arrested by the security police. So what do we see here? A state control system and then an underground economy. The underground economy is, is necessary, it's needed, and the allure, the draw toward the underground economy is natural. People all working together to, to help one another, and they're making well, maybe a little money on the side, but it's not bad. Uh, well, according to the Soviets, it is. Uh, they are simply using it then to improve their standard of living. And this poor cleaning woman in a state factory. She needs that extra money because her husband's been arrested by the security police. Perhaps her husband was involved in a little bit of speculating himself. If these manifestations of human enterprise were not wiped out, it is easy to guess what they would lead to. A worker would set up a plumbing repair shop. His neighbor, who secretly sells alcohol to people who want to drink in relative privacy, would open a cafe. The cleaning woman would become a merchant, peddling her goods. They would gradually expand their businesses, and the lower middle class would reappear. See, that is the enemy. That is the enemy of the communist. The lower middle class. They can't stand it. They can't stand it because they, there's something within the lower middle class that aspires for uh, commerce, for, 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 uh, or something, for to improve their lot, and they'll engage in... in private economic activity in order to do so. They would gradually expand their businesses and the lower middle class would appear. Introduce freedom of the press and of assembly and publications catering to this clientele, the so-called bourgeoisie, would spring up like mushrooms after the rain. And there would be the petty bourgeoisie as a political force. So you've, you've got to crush it. I love this section of the book and this is why I had to read it just word for word because it really does, again, it crystallizes why uh, communists hate the private market economy. So that's the petty bourgeoisie. Got to do something about them. Got to do something about them. Can't allow this private underground economy to continue. And he definitely can't. I mean, look at this. This is, these are derided today by many intellectuals in the West as uh, liberal, liberal values, like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. Yes, they are liberal values. And liberal political values naturally emerge when there is a thriving middle class. 
So that's the second group. Now the third group, the peasants. What is worse, Walsh continues, this matter involves the peasant problem, the peasant problem. So problem for the Soviets, the peasant problem. Peasants who make up the majority of the population of the country have a middle class mentality. Mm, a middle class mentality. They are more deeply attached to their few little hectares of field than the storekeepers are to their little shops. This mentality must be done away with. As late as the 19th century, the peasants were still living in bondage. It's called serfdom. They oppose collectivization because they see it as a return to a state their fathers found unbearable. So they see it for what it is. They, the peasants, are looking at the collectivization of agriculture and saying, wait a second, how is this any different from the serfdom that we had, that our fathers had labored under for centuries on end, and that was only abolished, what, like two generations or three generations prior? To leap out of bed at the signal of an official on a collective farm is just as hateful as to do so at the sound of a gong rung, rung by the overseer of an estate. The peasant's blind hatred, as the communists interpret it, worries the party. <laughs> and can you see how sick, how sick the, the, the mind of the, the party loyalist, the, the, how sick the mind of the communist is? And, and by the way, lest you think, oh, that was just Stalinist, the Stalinist version of communism. There's other forms of communism. No, 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 no. What Malosh is describing here is part a part of the broader general communist mentality okay the the hatred of course for the first this first class okay the one percent the hatred for the middle class especially the shopkeepers and the merchants and the craftsmen and all the others who start small businesses a hatred for them because they're too capitalist minded and then a hatred for the uh the uh the country uh bumpkin as they might be derided, the unsophisticated peasant who just doesn't understand that, that communism really, truly works for their best interests. They, they are blinded by prejudice and, and all the rest. That's the communist way of thinking about these people. And that's characteristic of communism all across the board in all sorts of different systems. They say they, uh, they represent the lower classes. They do not. They do not, rest assured. Thus, peasants are divided into three categories, Malos continues. So divide and conquer, old trick, an old trick. Peasants are divided into poor, middle, and kulak, the kulaks. Uh, kulaks were peasants who owned eight or more acres of land. So they were considered a wealthier peasant. This is a kulak here. This is not a state farm. This is a, a privately held farm owned by a kulak. Um, eight acres of land, by the way, is not that much, okay? But the kulaks were, uh, were demonized by the Soviet Union in the 1920s and in the early 1930s. Um, kulaks were rounded up. Many of them, uh, if they refused to uh, give up their land, were sent to the gulag. Peasants are divided into more poor, middle, and kulak in an effort to break their solidarity by engendering mutual antagonism. So the way, if you, so peasants are a majority, okay? <laughs> this is the Soviet solution. Peasants are a majority, got to do something about the peasant problem because they're not on board, really. They, they see it for what it is. They say, this is serfdom reborn. This is a, form of, a new form of slavery. They see it for what it is, so what do you do? You, you've got to divide and conquer. You, gotta, you, you, got, you have to prevent this group of people from coming together in solidarity. A peasant's wealth is rated not only by the amount of land he holds, but by how many horses, cows, and pigs he owns, how he lives, eats, and dresses. So you get the poor peasant feeling envious of the kulak, or the middle, pe the middle peasant feeling envious of the kulak as well, but maybe disdainful toward the poor peasant, and they can't come together in solidarity. So, but nobody wants to be a kulak, because kulaks are being sent to a gulag. And have and are have been targeted as enemies of the state, and a kulak is determined by the amount of land he holds, how many horses, cows, and pigs he owns, etc. 
Lest he fall, speaking again of a peasant, a peasant Kulak, lest he fall into an uncomfortable classification like Kulak, he drops farming and flees to the city. Or else he keeps only a minimum amount of livestock and pretends to be poor. As a result, the city suffers from a lack of provision. So this demonization of a more lower middle class peasant farmer, we might say, this demonization of the lower middle class farmer with you know a little bit of a little bit more land and a little bit more horses, the the the, the that demonization campaign causes kulaks to either flee to the city in order to avoid uh, the wrath of the state or to again pretend to be poor, leading to a uh, a, a lack of provisions coming from the farms. But he continues, sort of a sigh of relief for the Soviet official. But the peasants are not dangerous. They may beat up a party boss or even kill him in a burst of desperation, but nothing more. When the state is the sole buyer of their produce, as was the case, the state is the sole buyer of their produce, and when they cannot voice their protest at the amount of tribute the state demands of them, they are powerless. The security police... The security police can easily handle recalcitrance, especially since it can complain of no lack of informers. Now that informing has become an excellent means of saving oneself. And so, again, it's part of the divide and conquer strategy. The Soviets got the peasants fighting amongst each other based on the amount of wealth they held. And then within each of those groups, informants. And, and if you were an informant, you might save your neck. Because the, the Soviets learned, oh, okay, this is someone who's an ally, right? Someone who's working with us, who we can trust, will uh, will will sort of do our dirty work for us by by letting us know if someone's speaking badly. And, th and then the threat of an informant caused people to self-censor. If you're a peasant and you're not quite sure about somebody, maybe they're an informant. Are you going to speak? Are you going to try to organize something? I don't think so. And so the peasants are not dangerous. Pretty genius system, actually. The peasants are a leaderless mass. By the way, look at this photo. This is an incredible photograph of a collective farm. Look at that. I'm just going to expand it a little bit. I have a question. Where is the individual in this collectivized system? I don't see the individual. No, in truth, yes, there are individuals here, but they've all been collectivized. They're all part of the Borg. They've all been, they're cogs in a, mach uh, in, a, in a machine. Look at that. Incredible. And how anyone could look at this and say, oh, this is progressive. Some people do. Many people do, apparently. The peasants are a leaderless mass. History shows few instances, excuse me, History shows few instances, and this is correct, when they seriously threatened the rulers. The term peasant revolt sounds nice in textbooks and has a certain propaganda value, but only for the naive. Malosh is absolutely on target when he says that, by the way. Absolutely on target. And by the way, the ruling class knows this. They know this. In reality, the peasants have almost always served as a tool. Their leaders, most often of non-peasant origin, that's so key, their leaders, quote-unquote, their so-called leaders, they're sort of uh, uh, the self-proclaimed leaders of the peasants, most often of non-peasant origin, have used them for their own ends. The power of the peasants lies in their number. So there is power in the peasants. It's their numbers. But it is a power only when a man like Lenin comes along and throws the weight of their numbers into the scale of events. Man. Just right on target. Right on target. Exactly correct. Obviously, peasants can cause trouble in such moments of upheaval as wars. 
As long as a private peasant economy exists, it acts as a natural base for partisan operations. A peasant hut is the ideal place for partisans to eat, sleep, and work out plans of action. This is why you must collectivize agriculture. Get them off the private farms, get them off private land, get abolish the private hut, herd them all like cattle into these collectivized farms, where again, they, they function as cogs in a machine. Therefore, a collective farm where a man's every step is easy to trace guarantees a degree of control that is indispensable if one wants to preclude hostile underground activity. Bam! Exactly right. Look at this, this collectivized farm in Soviet Union. Look at the, the monitoring going on and, the, and the, look at the bureaucracy. It's just, it just makes, makes one sick to the stomach. And, and just the marching orders and uh, overseeing every single step, every single trace, or every single element of, of the, uh, the, the peasant laborer forced to work on that farm. So that's the peasants, group three. Now the final group, four, the proletariat, the workers. Workers are far more important than peasants. Here too, the Soviets have a problem. The Soviets have a problem. Most of them are antagonistic to the new system. Have you ever heard it? Sometimes you hear, uh, and you, you'll hear this about rural folk, and then you'll hear this about working class folk and factors, or whatever. Oh, you know, they don't understand their own economic interests, their own economic self interest. They don't understand it. That's a common attitude. Oh, they're, yeah, because usually rural folks and and working class, like truly working class people who work in industry and in the trades and in the factories, it, 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 barring some rare exceptions, they're not down with uh, with communism or socialism. And so the the excuses are made. Well, they don't understand. They don't understand their own interests. Um, here too, in the Soviet Union, it was assumed the workers they they don't quite understand their own interests. Most of them are antagonistic to the new communist system. That is understandable, Malosh says. They resent the norms they must fill. Those norms are constantly rising. So it's not as though, and this is why the workers, this is one of the reasons why the workers resented it. Because it's not as though under communism, their workload lightened. It didn't, it did not lighten. The workload was still remain uh, or even increased in intensity. Though the solidarity of the workers makes a fine slogan, it does not mean that the solidarity of the crews in a factory is to be tolerated. Their ranks are split by the institution of, quote, shock workers, which is fostered by an appeal to ambition and forced by pressure from members of the party cell. So if you're a communist, you do not really want a true solidarity of the workers. That's a bit threatening, that can imperil the system. And so you split up the workers, you create rivalries with among the, uh, the working class. A man may at first refuse to become a shock worker. So a shock worker is someone who was, uh, who supposedly volunteered to do extra work, to uh, work extra hard, to have extra output. And then they're rewarded uh, with, you know, a promotion or some sort or another, but grueling work. A man may at first refuse to become a shock worker, but gradually he learned it does not pay to be stubborn because when workers are being chosen for a course in bookkeeping, for instance, his application is rejected. Or when his turn comes for a free vacation, he is declared ineligible, etc. The attitude of the workers toward the regime is ambivalent, and this gets into some of the nuance because there is nuance here. On the one hand, they prize its positive contributions. Unemployment is a thing of the past. In fact, there is a constant lack of skilled labor. Okay, unemployment, not really a problem anymore. Not a bad thing if you're a worker. Not only the head of a family, but most of its members are employed. This accumulation of wages means that a family would be, ba would be able to live better than ever before if, oh, big if, if only the stores were fairly well stocked. But given a shortage of food and consumer goods, this is rarely, if ever, the case. Oh well. For workers' children, 
Social advancement is easy because the party must recruit the cadres of the new intelligentsia from their ranks. The worker can educate himself by attending countless evening courses. If he stands in good favor with the party, he can enjoy a vacation in a rest home, all expenses paid. Ah, the beauties of uh, socialistic communism. All expenses paid for vacation if you go along. On the other hand, he cannot defend himself against exploitation by his employer, the state. Ah, but I thought labor exploitation was a thing of the past. Not the case. His trade union representatives are party tools. Party tools. They team together with the factory managers for one purpose, to raise production. So the unions are worthless. Workers are told that a strike is a crime. Against whom are they to strike? Against themselves? After all, the means of production belong to them. The state belongs to them, all according to theory. So it's like, well, you can't strike. Well, why can't you strike? Well, because you're striking against yourself. Because in communist theory, you, the workers, own a means of production, right? <laughs> the state belongs to you, so you can't strike. It doesn't make any sense to strike. So you're disarmed. The unions are worthless, all of it. After all, the means of production belong to them. The state belongs to them. But such an explanation is not very convincing. The workers who dare not state aloud what they want. That's so key. The workers in a communist government regime dare not state aloud what they want. Know, so important here, know that the goals of the state are far from identical with their own. And this is ultimately why the workers are a threat. Because, yes, they see maybe some benefits here, even though that, you know there is the caveat that the stores aren't really stocked with food and goods or an adequate level of it. Yeah, there's no unemployment. Yeah, I get a vacation. But, okay, that's sort of good. But with this caveat, but then this, just no, it's obvious that the goals of the state are totally different from the goals of in the interests of the workers and they know that just intrinsically they understand it central and eastern europe produce in order to raise the military and economic potential of the center that is in moscow and to compensate for the industrial backwardness of russia workers and their needs have no influence on production plans most of the goods produced ebb away to the east and in other communist regimes the same sort of principle applies only to a different center that controls the production plans. The workers don't truly own the means of production, in other words. It does not serve, truly serve their interests. Besides, every product of a worker's hands is the object of innumerable bookkeeping operations. Ah, the bureaucracy. A whole staff of functionaries sits in every factory, counting, writing reports, compiling statistics. The same thing happens on every rung of the state hierarchy right through to the state wholesale houses and retail stores. If, at last, the article reaches a consumer, it is very expensive. Into its costs are counted the salaries of the swarms of bureaucrats through whose hands it must pass. So the, the wages you receive as a worker don't go very far because goods are so scarce and so expensive because of all many, many, many different issues. This problem of bureaucracy is one of them. Factory machines are overaged. There's a scarcity of essential spare parts. So workers are ordered to replace broken parts by whatever homemade means they can devise. Production comes first, even at the price of using up the machines. Discipline is severe. Negligence or even a few minutes lateness are strictly punished. Again, because there is no true union of workers and to state aloud an objection that you might have against factory policy, you'll be deemed a a potential enemy of the state may be sent to a gulag. So you keep silent. You even you keep silent even on the factory floor. You, not only can you not complain to a, a boss, you cannot complain to a fellow worker. They might inform on you. See, informants are everywhere. So you keep silent. Uh, Foucault, Michel Foucault, with whom I have some disagreements, and 
in other respects I admire some of his thoughts, especially when it comes to dissecting power. Uh, Foucault called this disciplinary power. <laughs> disciplinary power. So these were masters of disciplinary power. Communists are masters of disciplinary power. No wonder then that the bad side of the system outweighs the good in the worker's mind. The Soviets know this. The bad side of the system outweighs the good in the worker's mind. Still, he dares not complain. If he betrays any signs of discontent, the security police, whose secret agents are his co-workers and sometimes his friends, takes care of, takes care of him. Imagine that. Co-workers and sometimes his friends. Imagine the, the nightmare, the hell of living in a world in which even your friends are potential informants and you don't even know it. Or maybe they're not informants, but you can't take that for granted, and so you have to be circumspect around them. <sighs> Man. You can see why this is a hellish system. Everything thus takes us back to the question of mastery over the mind. Every possible opportunity for education and advancement is offered to the more energetic and active in individuals among the workers. The new, incredibly extensive bureaucracy is recruited from among the young people of working class origin. Oh, that's smart. The road before them is open, open but guarded. Their thinking must be based on the firm principles of dialectical materialism. Dialectical materialism was the uh, orthodoxy, the Soviet orthodoxy of the day. Theoretical, I won't say anything more on that. Schools, theaters, films, painting, literature, and the press all shape their thinking. So it's just everywhere. It, again, the definition at the beginning of the video of communism, an all-encompassing, an all-encompassing system. Schools, theaters, films, painting, literature, all has to, the press, all has to, to, to work in concert. All must conform to the dominant orthodoxy. It is alarming to see in the United States, in this third decade of the 21st century, parallels beginning to appear to such a, an all-encompassing system. The state, which, according to Lenin, was supposed to wither away. Oh, yeah, remember? This, a stateless society, supposedly. The state which was supposed to wither away, gradually is now all-powerful. It holds a sword over the head of every citizen. It punishes him for every careless word. It's merciless. The promise is made from time to time that the state will begin to wither away when the entire earth is conquered, lack any foundation. Okay, it's a fantasy. What do I, what do I call it? A utopian mirage. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't exist. You're a fool if you think, if you buy into it. Orthodoxy cannot release its pressure on men's minds. It's all about orthodoxy. You can't have dissent. In liberal societies, in liberalism, and when I say liberalism, I mean in a classical sense, liberalism of individual liberties and equality under law and individual rights. Liberalism is more and more under attack in the West in, in this third decade of the 21st century. And liberalism asserts that diversity of opinion on all sorts of different topics, but diversity of opinion must be protected and is overall a positive net for society. The Soviets say, no, 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 no. Orthodoxy, doctrine, must reign. Orthodoxy cannot release its pressure on men's minds, else it would no longer be an orthodoxy. And so that is the end. Hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I uh, hope you learned something. And again, I, you know, there's a lot more that he says in this book. It's just such a great book. Please read this book. Hope you enjoy this, and I'll see you next time. So long. Bye.